Good evening, and welcome to the Runlet and Baldacci Report. The first thing I want to mention is the passing of Henry Kissinger, 100 years old. My law partner, Ken Elshula, uh, his daughter, Amy, uh, gave me uh, a personal autograph from Henry Kissinger, which I will cherish. And speaking of great statesmen, we have one with us today. Uh, it comes from a royal family, a royal family from the United States whose name is among the most recognized in world history. And in our quest to bring you the best public servants that we have, we have uh, a person right now who is doing a public service to this country and Northern Ireland. Uh, Rob Baldacci, once again, has delivered um, uh, a, a huge figure for us. Uh, he's royalty not because of his birth, but because of the accomplishments of his family. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Joe Kennedy. Rob, go ahead. Joe, Congressman, former Congressman, uh, it's great to see you again. And uh, thanks for taking the time today to talk about, uh, to talk about your new role as a special envoy to Northern Ireland. So uh, our, our families do go back. I, I mentioned earlier, my dad worked with uh, Joe's uh, great uncle, uh, President Kennedy. Uh, we've worked with uh, Bobby and Teddy, and uh, I was a delegate for Teddy in 1980, in New York. Uh, and Joe's dad uh, was in Congress with sure. my brother, John. Yep. And uh, we became very good friends uh, over the years and, uh, and continue to do so. So, Joe, it's great to see you again. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your role in Northern Ireland right. and, and some of the issues that you're, uh, you're facing right now, Joe. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me. It is an absolute honor and a pleasure to, uh, for me to be uh, with you both. And Mr. Baldacci, let me just say to you uh, personally, I um, have been grateful for your friendship, that of your entire family, over the course of my life in, in public service. Um, you couldn't have uh, a better friends and, and friends of our family than, than you all have. Been. Thank you, uh, Joe. I appreciate that. That's not just for the support for us, but the example that you and your family continue to set for public service for the people of Maine and our country. Um, and you, yeah, an example for all of us to emulate. So thank you for that. I'm grateful for it. And grateful for the invitation here um, to, to be able to join you and, and engage in this discussion. Uh, uh, I've had the honor of serving uh, for the past uh, nearly a year now um, as President Biden's Special Envoy for Northern Ireland for Economic Affairs, um, and it's been um, an extraordinary honor for me. Uh, I will say um, you all are, are familiar with this role because of a very famous mayor that, that held yeah. it, the person to hold it, um, and a relative of yours, and, and Senator, a former Majority Leader George Mitchell. Cool. And I got to say, um, I don't think the Senator intended this, but uh, when you do what he did as the first person in this position, he set the bar pretty high for the rest of us to try to emulate, right? I mean, <laughs> well put, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so you you got you got high expectations to try to meet here, right? Um, and I gotta say, um, uh, Mr. Baldacci, the 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 example that he set is not not just the yardstick by which all of us will be measured by. Um, it's one that thanks in his in, in large part to his work, but the work that he helped um, create and create the space to create um, for the people of Northern Ireland, it's one that thankfully we don't have to uh, replicate because of the patience, the leadership, the commitment that he showed at, by the way, extraordinary sacrifice to himself personally, not of his family, uh, given the times that, that the amount of time that he spent in Northern Ireland rather than at home and, and with a young family. Um, mm -hmm. But what he was able to do, the credibility that he brought to that process, the trust that he was able to earn, right? Um, and he did earn it. Uh, it is still palpable today across the streets and communities in Northern Ireland. And I, I, I want to begin that way because <clears throat> I think it's a great example in public service of how each one of us it, to some extent, stands on the shoulders of those that went before, and what incredible shoulders uh, Senator Mitchell uh, has in the the framework that he he created for those of us to to carry on this work, um, uh, seek to continue. Uh, but because of his work and because of the example that he set, he did and was able to to help navigate some of the thorniest and, and trickiest and most difficult issues and gaps of trust that we've seen. Um, you know, at that at that time, almost anywhere on the planet, right? Um, right. And so, 
I come into this space um, being able to, to point to that record of success um, across the board, not on a partisan basis, but of one that shows a deep commitment to the people of Northern Ireland, um, to great friends in Northern Ireland, to friends in, uh, in uh, the United Kingdom, friends in the Republic of Ireland, and with an effort to say, look, that we come at this with, with no partisan agenda, just to try to continue to promote peace, prosperity, and stability people of Northern Ireland from a position of friendship and kinship. And um, that provides you an awful lot of space and an awful lot of latitude when you come at it that way. That's awesome. uh, Joe, um, uh, thank you for that and your connection to George Mitchell. But how, just how important is it that you are a Kennedy? And we all know about your heritage uh, uh, to Ireland. How big is it that, that you're a Kennedy when you go over there? How, how much does it help? You know, sir, I, um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, it's one that's a little bit difficult for me to answer because, um, you know, for, from my perspective, it, it's who I am. And so I, I wouldn't be who I am without that, um, without question. I think that there's, um, particularly when it comes to some of the issues and legacy issues in Northern Ireland, right, where... You've got um, uh, these uh, a long history of, of challenges and a, a community that is trying very hard to work through this these histories of uh, differences and, and conflict, not just around religious grounds, but nationality, definition, identity, et cetera, um, that it is easy to be able to be kind of labeled as um, and put in a certain category, put in a bucket of, oh, you know, as a member of Kennedy family, you're an Irish family and not right. a that's going to be interested in necessarily um, the perspective of unionism in, in Northern Ireland. Right. For such, right. I, you know, for my entire life, I've I've um, had to navigate uh, the way in which people will perceive me and uh, uh, because of the way in which um, they might have viewed correctly or incorrectly right. um, activities of, of some of my family members. That's not wholly new, but I will say, and, and, and I don't want to kind of overstate this, but it's where, gentlemen, the, the impact of Senator Mitchell, I think, has been so critical here because I came into this position not in a position of one that was looked at skeptically by one side or the other. Right. Well but said. Not as one that looked at was, hey, this is a Democratic, you know, yeah. um, uh, a position of a Democrat or Republican from, from American politics or a loyalist or <laughs> Republican from, from, you know, on, on issues of, of constitutional concern in, in Northern Ireland. Um, but one that came at this at, through an issue of let, let us try to find a way to promote peace, stability, prosperity for the people of Northern Ireland. And when you come at it from that perspective, right, not a political one, one rooted in community, one rooted in, in, in family, one rooted in, in common outlook for um, peace and stability, that provides an awful lot more latitude. And that has been one that I have tried to do my best to focus on. And that doesn't mean you 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 can ignore the, the politics of Northern Ireland, just like you can't ignore the politics in, in the United States, right? You, you can't right. do that. Right. But what you can do is try to acknowledge it and move through it such that we could do an event um, with uh, uh, our team on the ground with um, Jerry Adams, um, you know, off of uh, the Falls Road and sure. or later be with Jackie Redpath and um, on, on the Shanko, right? And right. be able to engage across community, right? Yep. Saying, hey, we're not going to see a divide here, but we are going to recognize the fact that the continual commitment of the people of Northern Ireland is to work through, right? Exactly. Not to ignore their history, yep. but to work, leverage the extraordinary sacrifice that so many have made to build to a, a, a place of a common future. Well, um, all I, yeah, okay, go, yeah, okay. Go ahead, Derry. All, all I can say, uh, Joe, is that uh, what you, uh, you answered my question, first of all, very well. And secondly, what you're expressing is the absolute sincerity, sincerity to keep the peace. And that's what George Mitchell did, and that's what you're doing. I commend you for it. Rob, go ahead. Yeah, jo Joe, in your role, uh, what are the issues that you're, you're focusing on right now? Obviously, you've got the Good Friday Agreement that established the framework moving forward. I've spent a fair amount of time in Northern Ireland myself. Uh, I've, I 
represented uh, the University of Maine and a university in Michigan for uh, trade and, and faculty and research uh, collaboration with Ulster and Queens. Uh, phenomenal resources over in Northern Ireland. I mean, they really are world class in terms of what they're doing. Are you working with those universities, Joe? Are you, uh, uh, are, are, you know, I know your focus is economic now and trying to, uh, trying to create more opportunities in Northern Ireland. Uh, would you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, Mr. Baldacci, so um, the answer to that is, is a bit of all of the above, right? And, yeah. and the opportunity here is one to, um, you know, an acknowledgement of the fact that, that politics in uh, Northern Ireland are, are sensitive at the moment. As you, you well know, there hasn't been a um, uh, storm at the local parliament there has not been been running now up and right. functionally functional in, in a while. Um, so um, their sensitivity to that, and and to be clear, those are issues that the people of Northern Ireland and their political process has to work their work their way through. They do have to work their way through them. Yeah, I think they are trying to work their way through them, and I, I, you know, this is hard, right? This is not an easy thing to do under the best of circumstances, and there's there's big questions there that they have to navigate through. For those that would say this is you know uniquely a Northern Ireland problem. I point out the fact that, you know, the United States government hasn't exactly had a banner in three months here either, right? We didn't have a speaker for a while. Um, that's, that's for sure, Joe. And um, there's there's deep divisions here and there's challenges as well. So this is not something unique to Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland's experiences um, might be unique in of themselves, but the, the, the struggles and the stresses of a uh, on a, a democracy at the moment are not unique to Northern Ireland. What I think we we can do is understand that at the, this moment of um, continued uncertainty around a political process, reset and reframe it and go back to that which we know is true, right? No matter what happens in terms of who is in charge of a political process, whether government is is functioning and, and as I say, stood up and, and running or not, people need to have a roof over their head. They need to have food on their plate. Their kids need to go to school. They need to be able to get to work. They need to be able to make, make a living. They need to be able to, to get the medical care and health care that they need when they need it. And so there's, a, as, as critical as that political stability is for long-term economic investment, and it is, there's also the reality that there's a day-to-day a -day, um, inevitability that we have to confront and that people still are going to seek answers to in spite of these big questions. So how can we focus on taking care of those basic needs Right, and making sure that there are there is in fact um, uh, businesses and 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 companies that are um, looking to meet the needs of the people of Northern Ireland, um, and not just meet those needs, but look at this as a very attractive market. Northern Ireland is today Belfast, as you go, you guys know, is the safest city of its size in the entire UK. Northern Ireland is the happiest region of the entire UK. If you've got a college degree, the unemployment rate is essentially zero. Um, it's got the, the highest concentration of it's a number one destination, I should say, for cyber security investment for for all of Europe. Right, they, they've got very good, strong um, uh, accomplishments to point to that have been earned by the people of Northern Ireland. And you point out the the research institutions in Queens and also universities that are best in class and that are cranking out extraordinarily talented graduates, which is why, by the way, you've, you've seen that that cybersecurity cluster come together so well. Mm -hmm. It's because of talent. It's because of the access to talent that they can get there. So there's a lot of things going for it. And I think if we just continue to focus on the politics, it would be like continuing to focus just on the politics of the United States without recognizing that, yes, we, we, we have, we've we got political issues we need to resolve. There's still good things taking place in the United States, um, you know, separate apart from that process. Even, you know, there's some good things happening from within that process. But Absolutely. separate apart, there, there's things to, to celebrate and recognize. Absolutely, uh, Joe. Uh, Joe um, uh, what you say about what you want to accomplish in Northern Ireland is, of course, what we'd like to see accomplished here in the United States. I want to switch the topic only because of a time constraint. Uh, in uh, two days ago, there was a paper uh, article in the paper. Today's Kennedys choose other paths to public service, and of course, they mentioned uh, Robert Jr. But they also mentioned you and Kathleen and others of your family that are currently still in the public service. And I did tell you that I met Ted Kennedy in 1967. I was among the first to you mean Bobby congratulate Kennedy. him on, you on mean the birth Bobby. of his son. And I also met Bobby Kennedy, your grandfather. I, I love them both. I was working oh, yeah. for Muskie. The question I want to ask you is, I'm not going to ask you about politics, but 
uh, is there any place in the world or any time that you can go where they don't know who you are? <laughs> I mean, yeah, plenty. Um, I mean, the um, look, it, it's a I'm incredibly proud of my family and uh, the commitment that my family has made and the contribution that we made to public service. Um, it, it is a um, it's a trying time for people involved in public service um, for a variety of complex reasons. We don't, you know, only need to get into to all of that, but um, it is one, um, you know, look, I, I think one of the blessings of my family is um, we have been very fortunate to have had people serve in office um, uh, to have friends that are, have been involved in public service. Public in service. every office except dog catcher. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a couple, we, we, there's times we've needed plenty of those dog catchers too. <laughs> Good job. Um, but what you have seen is, you know that it can make a difference. And you know that there are people out there for whom a difference um, needs to be made. And, um, you know, the, the part of the, the story that, that uh, my family holds dear is our history. Um, Right. Our history of um, being an immigrant family from from my father's side of the family, an immigrant family from Ireland in the, in the time of the, uh, the famine and um, and enormous pain and suffering and destitution and coming to the United States and not exactly being welcomed here with open arms. Um, and so I think um, like many families of an Irish descent, a a, a deep feeling of empathy um, because. Um, a lot of families were not able to to make it through those challenges, and it was a forced migration that sent folks of Irish descent all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. And um, on the one hand, there's comfort now in that you could go almost anywhere in the world and find uh, some connection to Ireland, but to also understand that that came out of you know not not just fortuitousness that fortuitousness that you can go to southeast asia or australia or some places you know in the far far flung regions of the planet and still find an irish bar but to know that that's there <laughs> oftentimes because of of a lot of pain and suffering that happened along the way right and, uh, and, and of course joe those irish bars are the best in the world aren't they yeah. <laughs> you can find there there are some things that they they have in common right and they they share and not to overplay this here but but they share that heritage they share that that um that sense of community um right. Uh, you all might have seen there's a uh, an ad that's gone viral from um, over the for for Christmas celebration of Christmas um, from Northern Ireland, um, which is interestingly enough um, starts with an an older gentleman that is uh, comes out of his house and goes to visit a, a gravesite of a family member and um, focuses on his isolation and ends up in an Irish bar um, in Northern Ireland a, a pub I should say excuse me. Um, but is greeted by community and is there with a coming together and a, a familiarity and a connection when people see each other as people, right? And not um, focusing on the different. And, and when, when you talk about community, I, I think Joe uh, of Northern Ireland, the, uh, and, I, and having spent a little bit of time there, the Falls Road, Catholic, Shankill, Protestant, the murals, the uh, the strife, the, uh, the the violence that's occurred over the years, uh, and even today, as you go looking at that peace wall, uh, which divides those communities physically and and probably uh, emotionally as well. I t I remember taking a picture of two little boys playing in their their yard, and in, in their backyard is that wall, and it's just it just brought to me, uh, you know, how these people have lived through this, Joe. And, and has it gotten any better? It's been a while since I've been there. But has it, from your perspective, how are things? That peace wall still remains, correct? There's peace walls throughout the city, but much right. better. Short answer yeah. there. And look, you know, it, it is a, a place where, um, look, there is still work to do. Um, and there's real work to do. And I, I don't want to minimize that because there's, there's work to do. But what I would tell you, you know, we, we just brought um, President Biden asked me to bring a, a delegation of uh, senior business leaders to Northern Ireland as part of um, the recognition and celebration of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement that Senator Mitchell would play such an instrumental role in, in, in bring to fruition. Um, and so we had some of the uh, preeminent business leaders in the world, right? President of Coca-Cola and, and, and John Murphy, the CEO of Liberty Mutual and Tim Sweeney and Liberty Mutual has done a lot of work in Northern Ireland now for for, for decades. Mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. 
uh, around the Good Friday Agreement. Um, so executives from Analog Devices and Boston Scientific and Barclays and Bank of America and, and a number of others, right? Um, it, it was a very strong delegation. Um, and what, what they saw was, um, yes, uh, you know, we took them through parts of Belfast and, and a historic tour so that they could see where things were. But they also got to see where things were going and the, the presence that was earned at enormous cost and enormous pain, but has been earned by now generations of peace builders in Northern Ireland, building towards a future where, thankfully, a younger generation today can, can take for granted that they can go through the streets of downtown Belfast city center and not have to walk through a magnometer, not have to go through airport style security, that they can just go shopping. And enjoy again the safest city of its size in the entire UK. Yeah, um, and there's still work to do. I don't want to minimize that. Right, of course. There's there's work that we need to do in Boston. There's work that needs to be done in New York City. There's work that needs right. to be done around the United States as well. And I think the the thing that I focus on here, Mr. Baldacci, is you know one of the the highlights of of this visit for me was when we were at Stormont at the invitation of Speaker Maskey, um, and we had a a, a panel. Um, of uh, highlighting some of the the leaders of the the Good Friday movement, right? Uh, to get to the Good Friday uh, Agreement, Mark Durkin from the SDLP, Lady Trimble, um, mm -hmm. Mr. Trimble's uh, widow, uh, Eileen Bell, um, Jerry Adams from Sinn Fein, and Peter cool. Robinson from the UP, right? Um, yep. And seeing Mr. Robinson and Mr. Adams ended up seated next to each other, um, and it. it it wasn't like they were they are the best of friends and and you know the, that's probably a, a, an undersell there right. but if you recognize who you recognize who they are and who they were 30 years ago and you think that 30 years later they're sitting on a panel together underneath uh, in the the building of the parliament of northern ireland talking about what they went through then and how they are trying to find a way forward and yeah. building the way forward. I mean, Mr. Baldacci, I got to say, it was a moment for me where I see, you know, deep division in, in history in Northern Ireland and folks trying to put that in their past and work forward. Yeah, where sure. I see in other parts of the world, including parts of our own country, where you're trying to highlight the division rather than highlight right. the similar. Right. Highlight the similar. Uh, Amen. Uh, Joe, what you Amen. say uh, is, is a word that we're hearing all the time. Hope. Hope. <laughs> And that's what George talked about when he went over there. That's what you're talking about. Your positive attitude is palpable. That's all yes. I can say. Yes. Your, it's obvious to me that when they uh, look into your eyes, they see the sincerity I mentioned earlier. And let's move forward. Let's, for, let's, we remember the past, but let's move forward. And I just want to commend you. And I can't think of any better person that Joe Biden could have promoted, uh, uh, appointed to this position than you. Amen. Uh, I mean, I'm glad George Mitchell was busy again this time around. So <laughs> no, he gave me a chance. Joe, can you give us an estimation about how much time we've got right now on your on your clock? Minutes? I think it's. Yeah, like, I got about five minutes left. Yeah, five minutes left. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, well, well, the first thing I want to say, and I'll let Rob close this out, is that the town of uh, the city of Derry, of course, was named after me, and I'm very proud of that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure you've been there. Yeah. Uh, and I tell people. It's well, London Derry, isn't it? Uh, but I want to thank you so much. I met uh, uh, Ted, I met Robert, I've now met you, and now my bucket list is complete. Rob, yes. you can close us out. <laughs> Very good, Derry. That's hard to top. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're busy. I know you've got a hell of a schedule, uh, but it meant, meant a lot that you, you were willing to, uh, to take a little bit of your time to, uh, to talk with us. Uh, do you ever see a day, Joe, where Ireland, North and South, the, the North and the Republic will be one? Oh, good question to close. You know, I, I think... Uh, Mr. Baldacci, that is obviously ultimately a question for the people of Northern Ireland and the Republic. And, and that process, as you well know, is, is outlined in uh, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement about those prospects going forward. And I think, you know, what is so important for people of Northern Ireland at, at this moment and going forward is to know that they have, they have a say in that, they have agency in that, that this isn't something else like you hear from folks that were um, were around during the troubles, 
and one of the hardest parts was the um you know the, the uncertainty the, the collective trauma that people felt because you didn't know what was going to happen at these um at these bombings in public places and and the disruption and the pain and the hurt and the suffering and the loss right. that then was felt across community um and people felt adrift from that and what happens when you don't have have a, a, a connection or feel like you can influence the outcome of something particularly in your home right. and what that that process articulated in that belfast good friday agreement says is this is up to the people of the island and there's a process there for the people of the island to northern ireland the republic to be able to make that decision if and when they want to make that decision um and so how i come at this is to say look oh, my my role in this as the special envoy for northern ireland for economic affairs is obviously not to try to to influence that in one way or the other, it's to do what the people of the United States have done for a long time, which is bet on the people of Northern Ireland, right? And say, we believe in you. We believe not just in your past, but we believe in your future. We believe in the kids that you are raising. We believe in the education that they're getting. We believe in the impact that they're going to make because they already have. Um, you know, it, it's an amazing thing when you start to um, learn the extraordinary impact that people of Northern Ireland have had on the United States. The number of folks that hail from Northern Ireland or, or right. old Northern Ireland heritage that um, that signed the, the Declaration of Independence, enormous, right? Number right. of them that hail from from Ulster, right, um, in Northern Ireland. The the the, the folks Mulholland Drive in Los Angeles, the famous road, that's named after William Mulholland, the guy that designed the water system for LA. You oh, know I didn't from? know that. Wow. <laughs> you know where he's from? Belfast. You know where they built the Titanic? Belfast. And as they're quick to say right. here or in Belfast, it was fine when it left there. Right? <laughs> um, so the, the impact that Northern Ireland has had on the United States yeah. is extraordinary and will continue to have on the United States. And that's what motivates me largely in this role is, is you know, not n not a vision as to where ultimately things will be, but to say the, the beautiful thing about a democracy is that you get a choice and you get a chance. And we want to we we believe in that process. We believe in in the people of Northern Ireland, and, and um, we believe in you, Joe. Perfect I'm Joe. so glad you reminded us of the reminded us of the impact of Northern Ireland on this country. Yes, and I have no idea, my dear friend, uh, where you're going to go in your future uh, in terms of public service. But I sure hope you stick around because uh, you're a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Amen to uh, that. Thank you so much, Rob. You can say goodbye. No. Joe, thanks again. Yeah. Uh, give my best to your family and uh, and good luck uh, and hap and Merry Christmas. Happy yes. holidays Thank you, my friend. to you and your family. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yep. Okay, my you friend. take care. Thank you, Joe. Um, uh, I have enjoyed so much uh, this show with Rob because he has um, taken us to, uh, in my opinion, a different level. It's much more fun to have a co-host and, and to not be uh, uh, political, to try to be a TV journalist. And Rob, what I was so impressed with was his humility and his sincerity. Do you yeah, agree? Totally. He, yeah. He's just a remarkable young man. He's got an incredible future. He served with distinction in, uh, in Congress. Uh, we've, I had him up here a couple of times. Uh, our family did. Uh, we did a couple of fundraisers <laughs> for Joe. And, uh, he, uh, and also with his dad, I, who I know very, very well. Uh, Joseph the second Joseph the second correct, correct. Uh, but it, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that he has this opportunity to serve in Northern Ireland uh, because I, I have spent some time there yeah and, and Rob when you mentioned that uh, forgive me for forgetting you thank you the, yeah. but the, so you went there uh, yeah. in an official capacity no I went there well I, first of all yeah. Uh, Senator Mitchell had had uh, and all the work he did with the Good Friday agreement had encouraged me to uh, look at uh, uh, the universities there. Maybe there's an opportunity for the University of Maine right. uh, specifically to connect in Northern Ireland. We share some of the same challenges yep. uh, and uh, being, you know, rem uh, remote locations, Northern Ireland at the, at the tip of, uh, of Ireland on sure. an island, Maine stuck into uh, Canada. Right. So uh, I was on the board of visitors for the University of Maine at the time, and I talked to, uh, uh, discussed it with President Hoff uh, at the time, and uh, he thought it was a great opportunity. So we put together a team of researchers and others, and, uh, and uh, 
ended up uh, uh, taking, uh, taking a week in meeting with uh, uh, the representatives from Ulster and Queens, uh, both outstanding universities, and right. they are so far ahead of us really? in, terms, in terms of their research and development. For the first time, I saw uh, how universities are able to incubate uh, business opportunities, working with family, uh, working with faculty, working with students uh, on campuses. These incubating facilities are located directly on the campuses, making it very easy for for businesses to connect with faculty and students, uh -oh. wow. and, and a whole wide ver variety array of uh, of uh, specialties. So. That's the model that I, we took back with us to the University of Maine. What, what year was this, Rob? Oh, it was back in, the, uh, uh, back in the late 1990s. Okay, right after the peace accord. After uh, the, the peace the, accord, the got, after right. the peace accord. So we didn't have to go through any barriers in Northern Ireland. Oh, you didn't? I yeah. found it to be very, very safe. Safe. Uh, I did. And then uh, my family and I went to Northern Ireland uh, and Ireland two years ago and uh, had a wonderful time. You played some golf over there. Played some golf. <laughs> and uh, we had a great time. And it's uh, Belfast is a beautiful city. Did you get to Derry? I've been to Derry. Okay. Yes. Uh, the bloody Sunday, bloody Sunday yes. scene. Uh, when I was over there with the University of Maine. I also represented a university in Michigan as well, uh, Central Michigan University. Wow. Took, took a group over there. Uh, and I, I just hope that it would, would have continued uh, after I left, uh, and hopefully it still does. But uh, uh, You know, Rob, when I went over there with my daughter uh, and again with my cousin, uh, Jill, and her family, uh, I remember making it my business, uh, being the social climber that I am, uh, to mention to, to people that I ran into, uh, I know George Mitchell. Oh, yeah. And every single time I did, the, yeah. the, the smile on their face, and this was, a, this was in Southern Ireland. I wasn't in the northern part yet. Yeah. Um, and I, I just have to tell you, that now I have two names I can drop. I go, yeah, Kennedy. Uh, but but what, what I'm so impressed with is that you and George, at different times, were going over from the same family. And so did you meet people that knew him over oh, there? Oh, God, yes. And, and what was the general reaction? Oh, they uh, both, whether Catholic or, or Protestant, right. uh, they uh, revered George. They, they love him. Uh, and, and still to this day. And uh, it's, it's, it's great to see. And I'm glad, even though, you know, George, uh, we had him on our show yep. a few weeks ago. He made it to, brought his family to Northern yes. Ireland for that dedication yes. at Queen's University. And the speech he gave, uh, you know, just very deep connections in, in the North. And I still have a lot of friends up there. Uh, one in particular, Frank Costello, who is a, a professor at the University of Ulster, he's a noted uh, historian, and used to work with Joe Kennedy's dad as an advisor uh, at his uh, when when Joe was a congressman. Right, so right. A lot of a lot of good connections. I love Northern Ireland, and uh, would encourage people to, uh, if they've never been before, take the time and go. Uh, everybody that has been there, every to a person, yeah. says they like it, even yeah. though. Uh, you know, I, I want to talk about those walls, these peace walls. What, what, what did they used to be? What were they? They like divided the, the communities. The repu the uh, you couldn't uh, cross into one side to the other. You could at certain times of the day, but then they'd have uh, gates that would close and lock, lock. And who uh, were they separating? What were they Catholics from? from Protestants? Oh my God! Uh, forgive my ignorance on that. Um, um, because I, I've, I've never been able to get my handle, uh, my head on around this, but I remember in, in George's book, Making Peace, Yes. Uh, he talks about the fact that when he first got there, I mean, they, they wouldn't even give him the time of day. No. They turned their backs uh, to him, uh, and yeah. yet he still, still persisted, 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 and, and, and eventually uh, it broke the ice. Uh, but when you got there, did you see the ice? Was there still some ice, uh, still some coldness uh, uh, around there? Uh, fra maybe fragments of it, yeah. but uh, not, no, not, uh, uh, not like it was back in the day. And uh, we stayed at the Europa Hotel, which was the hotel that George made a point of staying. Is that where he stayed? It was stayed? known as the, as the most bond hotel in Europe. 
What? Yes, the Europa in downtown. It was downtown the most Bel bombed hotel in Europe, and George stays wanted there. Wanted to make a point of staying. That's where I'm going to stay. And actually, President Clinton did the same thing when he was over there. Uh, now, Rob, I've never asked George this, but I'm asking you. I never thought about it. Was, was, was he, did he have a ton of security around him? Oh, I'm sure he had yeah. some security. But sure. Well, of course, and he's staying in that hotel. We're gonna, that's, that's a target. Yeah. Absolutely. I didn't realize it was a But he bomb. wanted to to basically demonstrate that, you know, we're we're here for peace. Uh, and uh, and so he put himself on the line, literally, uh, when he stayed there and made, made made a statement, made a huge statement to the people of Northern Ireland. That, uh, uh, as we talk about um, Joe Kennedy and George, the one question I have of you, uh, we both know that George went to the Middle East. Yes. And uh, he went over there in the hopes of bringing some peace. Mm -hmm. The question I ask of you, and, and uh, the crystal ball, do you think that if George had made even a scintilla of a difference, that what we're watching now on front page news, the worst thing is this, this stuff that's going on in, in Israel and, and, and the Gaza uh, Strip, uh, do you think he could have made a difference in that? Do you, do you think that this, this thing yes. could have been prevented by Yeah, uh, without a question. If they, uh, if they listened to him. Uh, he, he tried. He yeah. spent an, an incredible amount of time meeting with all the leaders, Egypt, Palestine, Israel, met with Netanyahu. He met with Assad in Syria, uh, countless trips. And uh, very frustrating. It's all, it, the, the animo you know, you're talking thousands and thousands of years That's of right. animosity Deep. and hatred yeah. uh, that he was trying to, to overcome. So, yeah, I mean, he put forth a, a, uh, a set of uh, principles called Mitchell, Mitchell uh, principles yeah. to, uh, to establish a two-state solution in, uh, in, uh, in Israel and Palestine, which needs to happen. Yes. And... Uh, uh, it's it's just horrible what's going on today, uh, and uh, uh, but yes, to answer your question, I think George would have made a hell of a difference. Uh, and what what amazes me, folks, is that this man, uh, as is Joe right now, uh, put himself in danger without any question. First of all, just flying back back and forth on these planes oh, yeah. and having to go to hotels and uh, folks, you have no idea. What it's the trouble that this man went through, uh, not being away from his family, uh, same with Joe, uh, it, to try to accomplish something as big as peace in, in two of the most volatile places on the face of the earth. And I, I'm not sure that people here in Maine recognize the incredible effort that that man put in, uh, working not 24 hours a day, but 36 hours a day. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Rob, I want to commend you on getting Thank this you, interview. Thank you, Folks, uh, as we uh, say goodbye on this show, I want to tell you that uh, uh, my friend Rob is going to take this show to a whole different level. Uh, we've got some people lined up that we think you're going to enjoy. And what I yep. enjoy most, Rob, is that you seem to have a connection to everyone. It's not the six degrees of Kevin Almost Bacon. as many as you do. <laughs> it's, it's the one degree of separation from Rob Baldacci. Uh, thank you very much for watching the Ronald and Baldacci Report. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.